it wasn't really meant to be a book in the first place. Uh, it was basically just Marcus's personal philosophical diary, and he had no intention of publishing any of it. So that's part of what makes it so fascinating is <clears throat> he was just addressing himself the whole time, uh, looking inward. Um, so we're just reading the diary of the emperor of Rome in the second century, and a lot of what he says is still relevant today, and uh, probably always will be relevant to the human experience. So let me just kind of lay out a timeline here. So Marcus Aurelius was born in the year 121 AD, and his dad died when he was young, and then he was adopted. And so he was the last of a long series of emperors who were not born to the throne, which started in 96 AD with Emperor Nerva. And that streak ended when Marcus's son Commodus became emperor after Marcus's death. Um, and apparently this time period of adopted emperors was great. It was the height of the Roman Empire, or the Pax Romana, uh, which is the term for um, Roman peace. It's so like the Pax Romana was like, you know, the peak of the, the empire. Hundred, a couple hundred years, I think, or maybe like 150 years or so. His first act was to delegate some of that power away by having his adopted brother as co-emperor. His name was Lucius Verus. Um, so, you know, Marcus could have been the emperor, you know, the, the Darth Vader, the sole ruler of the empire. Mm -hmm. But right out the gate, he shed some of that power and lets his people know, uh, you know, what he's all about. You know, it's like he's trying to be uh, a good dude or a good ruler. Um, so this was the first time that the Roman Empire was ruled by more than one emperor simultaneously. And uh, that became a more common occurrence later on. Um, so the first thing he had to deal with was the flood that happened in the year 161, where a lot of people died and lost their homes, and he kind of did his best to, you know, alleviate the city's suffering. Um, and then soon after that, it's where shit kind of hit the fan, right? The Parthians started attacking from the east, and Marcus sent Lucius Verus uh, to deal with that. While Marcus stayed in Rome to deal, or you know, to manage the economic and legal matters, uh, so he was good with legal matters and spent a lot of the time in that space. I guess he was strict when it came to things like uh, tax evasion, but he was also compassionate in some cases. So there was one time where a woman, uh, she like married her uncle without knowing that they were related, and although that was illegal. Uh, Marcus Aurelius sympathized with her and confirmed uh, the legitimate status of her children. Um, so kind of, he kind of let that one pass. So he had a heart. Right? I don't know if all the emperors around that time period would have been the same way. I don't know how hardcore they were compared to him, but um, he seemed like he was a more... He just... <laughs> you know, he had some compassion. It's kind of crazy to think about. He just... But he, at the same time, he legitimized incest kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little more common back then. Yeah, true. I'm sure it was. So. But yeah, apparently she didn't know it was her uncle, so who knows. Uh, yeah, so then he continued to build up the armies in the west, and eventually the army in the east uh, pushed back those Parthians that were attacking. So after this, Lucius Verus... Uh, began indulging in the luxuries while his legion officers were doing most of the work. Uh, and then when Lucius and his legions returned back home in 166, they, uh, they brought smallpox with them that they caught in the battles. And it got pretty bad. Apparently, like, thousands of people were dying per day, and it thinned out much of the working population. But So later, later that year, same year, uh, many of the Germanic tribes began attacking from the north and breached, breached Italy and converged on the wealthy city of Aquileia. <clears throat> and no barbarian forces had entered Italy since the Cambrian War 300 years prior. So just like, bam, bam, you know, smallpox, oh, Germanic tribes invading. They're, you know, getting just hammered from all different fronts. 
and uh, but the the Germanic tribes could not siege the city, and they retreated north. Uh, but they did leave a path of ruin behind them. So, with all that said, Marcus had to get more reinforcements, and so he offered amnesty to uh, certain criminals if they served in the army, and uh, slaves and gladiators were given their freedom. Oh wow! So he's basically just pulling people, yeah, pulling people out, getting them back into work because people were falling left and right. So he, uh, he also sold off a bunch of imperial valuables uh, to, real, to raise funds, including personal things such as silverware and his wife's nice clothing. Ooh. Sold her clothing. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, he was kind of doing these things that were, you know, helpful, but also kind of showing, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not above everyone. Like, he, he was trying to really show that he is human as well. So he's, like, getting rid of his nice stuff to to help people out. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the actions kind of tie in with the things that he talks about in his meditations, which, again, we'll, we'll get into some of those, but uh, very stoic, right? So Marcus left Italy for the first time in uh, the year 168 and brought Lu- Lucius with him, uh, but Lucius suffered a stroke and died, leaving Marcus as the sole ro- ruler of the Roman Empire. So... Uh, you know, seven years in to his reign, he was, you know, co- they were co-emperors, now he's the, the only emperor. And what followed was years of battles between the Romans and their Germanic neighbors. Um, Marcus had proved a supreme commander that would help with managing and leading the wars. Um, so while delegating, uh, you know, making, while delegating, making decisions for the war, Marcus continued responding to petitions and judging legal cases, so he was just you know under intense pressure the whole time between battles, judging things, uh, being a organizer, just all these things that the emperor has to do. Constant pressure. Oh yeah, and he had to he had to pick up the slack from all the stuff his brother was doing that he wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Exactly. Yeah, he's just he's the only guy. Uh, but you know it was like they had other people and you know senator or whatever that were had their own rules but or roles but yeah he was still he was top dog so but meanwhile in his personal time he wrote what would become one of the most well-known pieces of stoic philosophy in history so uh his meditations uh packed with contemplation relating to death were inspired by brutal marcomanic wars and, you know, many historians believe that if Marcus was living peacefully at home with his family, he probably never would have put pen to paper. You know, it's like all this madness he was going through, his escape was writing, and that's why you get what we have today. By 175, Marcus's legions were occupying the northern lands of Marcomania and forced many of their allies to conclude peace. And they moved south to take down the Sarmatians. But soon after, news came from the southeast that one of Marcus's trusted viceroys, Avidius Cassius, had declared himself emperor after stirring false rumors that Marcus Aurelius had died, and he began seizing eastern provinces. So it's not like he had enough to deal with already. You know, one of his generals just decides to go and tell everyone, yeah, Aurelius died, I'm in charge now. Uh, So it's just nonstop crap that he had to deal with. Dude, that general has one hell of a name. He was destined to do something. Avidius <laughs> <laughs> Cassius. Dude, everyone's name at that time was nuts. That's what you should name your son, dude. Just bring a Cassius into the world. Avidius. Avidius? Oh, man. <laughs> some, it makes it hard to read some, sometimes, you know. You're going through a an old book like that, and everyone's name is just crazy. Crazy. And they all have the same name, too. Like, names would change. So when you get adopted, you take the new name. So, like, Antoninus. (laughs) Yeah, you get, like, the, and, yeah, like, depending on the time period of reading about, like, there's an Antoninus, and then there's another Antoninus, and, you know, not Chlamydia. (laughs) (laughs) Chlamydius. Shoot, what's the guy's name? Chlamycus, that's what I was trying to think of. There's, like, two different Chlamycuses in history that you can read about. Uh, so Avidius Cassius uh, betrays Marcus Aurelius and 
declares himself emperor. Uh, so an imperial governor from that area remained loyal to Marcus and sent a messenger west to alert them of the threat. And after months of confusion and betrayal, Cassius was assass assassinated by a loyalist and his head was sent to Marcus, who refused to see it. So another wild thing about that time period is every time they had to kill you know, some big name, they always send yeah, the head prove it. Prove you know, the for bounty. confirmation that they're dead. That was like... You can't just send him a miss, uh, you know, a picture of like, hey, this happened. It's like you need proof. You got to deliver the dude's head. So afterwards, Marcus headed east to assure its loyalty, uh, basically make, letting them know, like, yeah, I'm here still, we're good. Uh, before returning to Rome and making his son Commodus his co-emperor in 177. Uh, in late 178, both father and son left Rome again to go north and lead their armies in the second phase of the Marcomannic Wars. Uh, and then after two more years of battles, Marcus became very sick with the plague in the year 180, and he passed away, and with him also died the Pax Romana. Uh, so basically after that, his son became the ruler, and I guess that was kind of the start of the fall, the decline of the Roman Empire. So like Marcus Aurelius was like the end of the... Yeah, the bet the last of the great emperors. Well, the problem was he probably, you know, was raised his whole life and just being and getting whatever he wants in royalty, which was very different at the time. Maybe he didn't pass around yeah, that I same, mean, pass down like the same thought process to his son, you know. Yeah, it's like, you know, five was it five straight emperors that were adopted, and that was the, the prime of the greatest empire ever, like pretty wild to think that that's possible that's, but it makes sense you know they go through a struggle they have a they have this hardship and it kind of sets this you know these values and, and things that they can bring into a leadership role whereas yeah you have someone who has everything handed to them they get that leadership role it's like okay they might just be power hungry they might not have the morals the values that are necessary to keep things alive so so yeah that's pretty much his story as emperor at a high level. Um, so when we read meditations, we're basically diving into the personal thoughts of the leader of the Roman Empire at its peak, or at least pretty close to its peak. And, uh, yeah. So something else that's interesting about um, his writings are they were written in Greek. Uh, most Roman philosophers were wrote in Latin. Oh. So both languages were used across the empire. Um I think Greek was more common in the East, but I believe he learned both languages. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, I think some people kind of say, like, he was writing in Greek. It kind of goes into, like, this was his escape from all the stuff that was going on in his world. And, like, he's he wrote in Greek as also a, kind of as a an escape from, you know, the basic Roman life, like... This was his personal time to get away. I would imagine it and, uh, look, look in. kind of made it more secretive, too. Because everybody around him, like, everybody could read Roman. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Not everybody probably knew how to read Greek. 